My name is Emily May Armstrong and I'm on a screen today as I'm actually at a conference in Boston but I'm also on the screen today as I'm physically disabled and working towards my PhD in the Institute of Molecular Cell and Systems Biology. This talk is going to blast through my lived experiences in research but also hopefully offer advice on navigating disability for both students and staff. I have a genetic disease called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome which is a cluster of heritable connective tissue disorders. I have chronic pain, chronic fatigue, daily dislocations and secondary conditions that cause frequent fainting, bizarre allergic reactions and transient memory loss. So, the question that brings us all together today is how do we create a vibrant, inclusive and supportive research community which attracts the best students and nurtures the next generation of leaders? We need to show a positive track record of supporting and caring for disabled researchers. But we will only achieve this if we make significant positive changes to research environments. And this relies on able-bodied lab leaders instigating changes to how their labs function and then being wholly aware of how to properly support these students. It's worth pointing out that in the UK, uh, disabled people are three times less likely to hold any qualifications than non-disabled people. They're also half as likely to hold a degree level qualification. Considering that 20% of the adult working population are disabled, we've actually got a lot of work to do. So I'm going to go through some of my lived experiences to give you all a flavour of what disability adjustments look like. Um, and things that I've found beyond helpful in the lab include my incredibly supportive colleagues who aren't afraid to help me with heavy lifting or pipetting concentrated hydrochloric acid for me, which is something nobody wants to do when they have a partially dislocated shoulder. For them to support me, I have to share my symptoms. My disability is variable, which means what I can do some days, I can't actually do the others. And it helps everyone around me to know that. A prime example of this was after a traumatic hip dislocation in September last year, where I was unable to walk properly for two months. Letting my colleagues know meant I could take some of the pressure off of myself and they were more aware of my needs, so they could alter their practice accordingly. Disclosure can sometimes be uncomfortable, but it's really necessary for safe research. I'm going to move on now to the topic of reasonable adjustments. Uh, I love them and I definitely wouldn't be doing a PhD without them. So my reasonable adjustments include my ergonomic lab chair, an office chair with more levers than I know what to do with, an ergonomic mouse that stops my wrist from dislocating and a brand new set of brilliant pipettes. These were organised by the disability service. Um, having these small changes means my dislocation rate has been reduced by half. Equally, I have other adjustments which deviate from what's considered standard lab practice. I only wear gloves if it's 100% necessary, as doing so stops me from regulating my body temperature, and this can cause fainting spells. I tend towards single-use plastics instead of washable glassware, as this uses up extra energy. Having a disorder which results in limited energy supplies also means I can't put as much effort into cleaning my workspace as I should, as this takes away actual energy I need for my research. What matters here is that your lab mates are really understanding. A final adjustment I have, and this comes from a place of academic and research privilege, is the opportunity to hire a summer student to help me with larger experiments and working in the cold room, and this is funded by my supervisor. They get experience in assisting a PhD student and in project management, and I get a willing pair of hands to help me with the things I couldn't otherwise manage. Of course, reasonable adjustments must also go beyond the physical ones. If you're supervising a student with atypical needs, I've got a few suggestions. My first is to research. You are a researcher by nature and will excel at researching your student's condition. What takes 30 minutes of your time now will save hours of explanation and difficulty further down the line. I'd also recommend considering if it's feasible to create an emergency dry lab project which can be done from the student's home. Is it possible for them to do all of their reading and data analysis from home if they need it? Do you mind if they take time off for hospital appointments and work atypical hours? It's also worth considering how well do you know sick leave procedures and do you know what medical evidence they need for thesis extensions? If you're in doubt about any of this, always contact the university's disability service and ask how best to support your student. They'll be able to point you in the right direction. Your students should also know this information, but it's really important that you're both on the same page and can work through supporting each other. Finally, be willing to modify your practices. If you're teaching a new technique, sit down with your student and go through it with them in a lot of detail. Let them flag up what they might struggle with and build a workaround together. You should have knowledge and understanding of their needs and be able to work through it together. Also, don't be afraid to start the conversation by asking, how can we do this? My final point for students attempting research with a disability is to trust your judgment. Nobody knows your body or your mind better than you do and you are in control. So with the good come the bad, and I've also had a few bad experiences, but these mostly arise from people's lack of understanding. 
This could come from a failure to make reasonable adjustments because they haven't researched my condition. Um, and in research environments, there's often a culture of working very long hours, which places strain on many students, including myself. So you need to be aware that long days may be detrimental to a student's physical or mental health and check in with them if you think it might be. The invisible nature of my disability also plays into this. I don't have any visual disability signifiers in the lab on a day-to-day -day basis. My crutches were going to the pub and making sure I can get a seat on public transport. It's not for working in the lab. I remember people's confusion when I first dislocated my ankle in the lab and was on a night out and under five hours later. <laughs> if you're sharing a work environment, you need to know about someone's altered needs and never ever be surprised by their choices or by their decisions. This brings me to my concluding points. If you're not sure how best to support your disabled students and staff in the lab, just ask them. Be confident in modifying your lab environment with their input. If your lab is accessible for disabled people, it's almost 100% going to be accessible for every other lab member and you need to build your space around those with different needs. I firmly believe that systemic change will only be achieved once all levels of academia are working together to modify an environment that was established by able-bodied people. And for us to do this we need to be willing to talk, support and challenge the inherent biases that we carry. A good way to do this is checking out the Harvard Implicit Test for Disability which shows you how much inherent bias you carry. The answers aren't always pretty but they open up to where our biases lie and how we can improve them. So I'd like to thank you all for listening. If you're interested in chatting to me more about disability liberation or you have any questions from today, want to know more about rebuilding lab spaces and supporting disabled research students, you can find me at Emily X Armstrong on Twitter, The Radical Botanical on Instagram, on my Glasgow email or on my website where I discuss disability, intersectional science and playing with plants.